Good morning, good evening, good day. Whenever it is you're watching this fantastic program, the Danny Schneider Show of Music, I'm truly honored today to have um, um, my guest, uh, Ken Cragen. Uh, Ken Cragen is the manager of uh, Kenny Rogers and Travis Tritt and Trisha Yearwood. Um, he managed the Bee Gees, the Lionel Richie, Olivia Newton-John. He put on uh, the events uh, we, are, um, we Are the World and Hands Across America. I have read his book numerous times. I have underlined all the pages. Where's some underlining? I got it underlined. There we go. I've underlined it everywhere. And um, I'm really happy to have uh, this opportunity to be with you, Ken. My pleasure. It's a lot of um, fun. Thank you. Your book is called Life is a Contact Sport. Can you uh, tell me why you titled that? And Well, and I think first and foremost, it was kind of a clever title. But it, yeah. it does refer to, you know, we talk a lot about networking in the book and how, uh, you know, life really is in a way a sport. And you got to play it to win and you got to play it to uh, be in touch with other people. I mean, of course, I teach at UCLA now. Mm -hmm. uh, we network cr like crazy. I mean, you have 120, 150 students. I tell them, hey, in this room is somebody who's a contact for you to almost mm -hmm. anything you need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I sit down on airplanes next to people who turn out to be tremendous contacts. And uh, that isn't the main thrust of the book, but mm -hmm. it would seem to be a clever title for it. I see. So what your philosophy is then is that Everywhere you go, maybe you should have like fun and just and meet people. Yeah, and that, you know, it's that that whole uh, thing, six degrees of separation. It, mm. you, there's somebody you know who is mm -hmm. a conduit to where you to the to the person you need to get to know, mm -hmm. um, and and it's just true. I find it everywhere in my life. I can almost always, no matter what I have to accomplish, find someone who will lead me to the person that I really that really needs to mm -hmm. say yes to whatever I have to you know to sell or uh -huh. or propose. Let's get right into it. You're an uh, artist manager first and foremost, right? Yeah. With Kenny Rogers and, well, many. Um, what is the role of an artist manager? And also, um, what qualities should an up and coming artist look for if they were looking for a manager? Well, I, when people say to me, what does a manager do? I always say everything but sing. Because uh -huh. as far as I'm concerned, my job is to do everything necessary to advance a career. Mm -hmm. And that could be selling the souvenir books at a concert or it could be booking the travel or it could be I mean I've done it all at mm -hmm. one point I don't I don't there are no rules about management anybody can be a manager you know mm -hmm. wives are managers attorneys are managers publicists are managers best friends from high school are managers mm -hmm. you know and since there is and managers manage differently some managers like Peter Asher who managed James Taylor and live and uh, Linda Ronstadt is a ex-performer who is a producer, so mm -hmm. his strength was in the music, and somebody else's strength might be in negotiating. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I've always felt it was whatever was necessary. I was kind of like a, you know, the uh, the utility infielder who could play every position, sort of. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the other thing, the, the most common question I get asked after, you know, what what does a manager do? Really, is what should I look for in a manager? Mm -hmm. And and I tell people start with one word honesty mm. above all else find yourself someone who you can trust mm -hmm. someone who will tell you the truth someone who will be honest this is very important someone who will be honest to you about what they don't know mm -hmm. so they'll say to you I'm sorry I don't know that but we better go find somebody who does mm -hmm. who will be honest to you when they make a mistake won't blame it on somebody else won't blame the record company if it's their fault or so I think mm -hmm. that's critical it's critical in any relationship but it's really critical if you're gonna have a manager mm -hmm. I mean there are every artist out there practically has a has had an experience with a dishonest representative either an agent or manager mm -hmm. who took advantage of them early in the career and it was difficult and most of the artists that succeeded overcame those negatives but mm -hmm. that would be first mm -hmm. secondly I want you to look if you're looking for a manager I want you to look for someone who really believes in you mm. who because Management's tough. You have to break down a lot of doors, go up against a lot of walls and mm -hmm. climb them or get around them. And you have to have that true belief that your artist is terrific, that mm -hmm. they're the, you know, a unique talent special in order to be able to have that resolve to get rejected time and time again and keep fighting, keep pushing, keep... And so, so you need someone who really believes in you and that's the second thing. Mm -hmm. Then you look for experience and judgment and you know, and other things, creativity, negotiating ability, contacts. Uh, but I think the first two things, honesty and truly somebody who's a fan who mm -hmm. believes in you. Oh, yeah. you know? That sounds really good. 
Um, let's talk about a few uh, concepts in your book. The one that really got my attention, I've actually used. In fact, um, one of the reasons why we're, I'm actually doing this show now is because of your book. Oh, that's good to know. Uh, it it and brings the whole thing full circle. It kind of does, yeah, yeah, it really does. But one of the concepts I've actually used, and uh, which I thought was excellent, is what uh, you call the event strategy. Yeah, the magic of threes is another yeah. way to put it. Uh, I, you know, it comes from my uh, looking very almost scientifically at what happens in careers, hmm. and and creating a foundation for a, for a concept of a way careers work. A lot of people think of careers as kind of going up like mountain climbing, and you're going from one rung to the next. Try mm -hmm. to get to the top of the mountain. Problem is when you get to the top of that mountain, maybe it's the wrong mountain, or you know uh, maybe there's a higher one, or someone else is already there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know whatever it is, I don't look at careers that way. I mm -hmm. look at careers as being on a plateau. Some, and, and in fact, I think the, the life of a product, the life of a company or a personal career is on a plateau at any one time. Mm -hmm. You're, and that plateau will erode over time unless you do something, unless there are certain events along the way that prop it up. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get from the plateau that you're on now to a still higher plateau, if you want to make that leap, mm -hmm. you have to concentrate things in a very tight period of time. You have to pull them together so that they give you an explosion of activity and, and almost like a rocket or stuff that pushes you to a higher level. Uh -huh. And interestingly, the higher and higher you go on the plateaus, the longer, the higher you go, the longer the glide before you'll ever get back down to where you started. In fact, you probably won't if you get high enough. Hmm. And, and the interesting part, I, it's sort of like a, it's like a small plane is the way I like to think of it. You power up to a certain level. If you turn the engine off and you're a mile up, you'll glide for eight to 10 miles. I mean, there's an eight to 10 ratio of the height. Mm -hmm. If you're 10 miles up, you'll glide for 80 to 100 miles. Hmm. So you'll glide much further. And if you get high enough, you know, you're basically, even if nothing else happens, if you never turn the engine back on, or mm -hmm. even if, or if you turn it on a little bit periodically to maintain a level, mm -hmm. you're never gonna go all the way back down to where you started. And it, one of my favorite stories, I, it's true, uh, Kenny Rogers called me up and he was talking to me about careers. And he said, Kenny, he said, careers are either spiraling upwards or they're spiraling downwards. And I said, mm -hmm. no, 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 Kenny, and I explained my, philosophy to him and the small plane concept and mm -hmm. the thing and the, I said Kenny the plane you're on is so high at this point mm -hmm. that if you do nothing if the engine never runs again for the rest of your life I said your career will go on way past the end of your life mm -hmm. and there was mm -hmm. silence on the other end of the phone he didn't say anything and then all of a sudden you he past said, the end of your life That's yeah good. he That's said true. he said Ken I think I'm planning on living a lot longer than you think <laughs> Which, oh, you know, mm -hmm. typical of Kenny Rogers. But the point is that if you look at careers as this plateau, what you're going to do is concentrate activities in a tight period of time, and you need at least three. The, mm -hmm. the whole key to this is what I call the magic of threes. The whole key is bringing at least three events together in a concentrated period of time. And you need to do that because in today's marketplace, you can't sell anything. You can't sell yourself, you can't sell a product, you can't sell an idea unless you get somebody's attention first. And you just don't get people's attention with one thing. I mean, artists think, I got on The Tonight Show, I made, my career is off and running. If you don't surround that with other events closely packed into the same period of time, that public out there that you're reaching is not gonna remember who you are. You're not, no matter how big an impression you make on that show in the one shot, mm -hmm. unless other things happen around it at the same time, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that momentum. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is you've got to bring things that were going to happen quite a bit later, speed them up so they happen right at the same time you're on The Tonight Show or whatever. Mm -hmm. Things that are going to happen now, slow them down, delay them, so they happen right at that time. Concentrate things, concentrate them. Within days, weeks, tight. Yeah, as days, close as you can. Yeah, as a day, a week, a, no more than a month, mm -hmm. I mean, whatever. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the best example I have is Lionel Richie on the Olympics, 1984. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, four billion people saw Lionel. Huge, everybody in the world practically, I saw him. you know? <laughs> Didn't advance mm -hmm. his career. Nothing around it, no album, no, no uh, magazine stories, no other television, nothing. Yeah, you wrote that he was delaying his album. Yeah, he kept pushing it off. If and he could have had that album in the, on the racks when he was on the Olympics, plus a few other appearances. Yeah, magazine appearances. Now, you gotta remember something. When you're, when you're a performer reaching the general public, even though I talk about you need three impressions uh, to, to mm -hmm. make it to get somebody's attention, the recipient has to receive three impressions. 
Now, if, you're, if I'm trying to get your attention, I can target three things at you. I only need three things to mm. get your attention. Mm -hmm. But if I'm talking about that audience that's out there, that audience, and that larger audience, if I'm talking about that, mm -hmm. it takes multiple impressions, maybe a dozen, for any one person out there to get three. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So if you surround mm -hmm. that Tonight Show appearance, you've got to surround it with magazine articles, record releases, stories, go on, you know, interviews, mm -hmm. other shows, so on, so that the public out there, some certain number of people are going to see you at least three times. I see. You and can't just gonna... do three. You have to make sure that the, you have to think the recipient Perfect. has to get to three. They have to get the three. So you and have to do more critical. than three. Yeah. Unless, and this is the other thing, unless you're targeting somebody, you know, an individual. I mean, mm -hmm. I, used to, uh, I had a fellow on the road with me uh, doing um, my technical stuff. Mm -hmm. And one day he comes in and he says to me, boy, I've been around you hearing this magic of threes for so long. I started doing it myself. He said, mm -hmm. I went home and I got up in the morning and I made the bed and then I went down and cleaned the garage and then I went and cleaned up the kitchen. And he said, after the third thing, he said, my wife came in and hugged me and she said, boy, she said, <laughs> you know, what a wonderful good. thing you do. For, you know, it was great. Uh -huh. So now the funny, the funny part of this is I tell my wife about this story. I said, She's onto it now. Yeah, huh? well, she said, no, my wife says, you know, Ken, four will work just as well as three. <laughs> so. That's what I was going to. I was going to tie that in because what was coming to my mind is that you could, uh, and you make this point in your book that you can use this with anything. It doesn't have to be music career. It could be no. you work for um, IBM or or in personal relationships or in school. You know, school. And, and you're, you're, I mean, I turn in a paper in an astronomy course I took at UCLA, an, an extension course, and you know, I, the same day that I did that, I brought to the class a. A, a document I had on this on space and an old manuscript on space, and I uh, and I brought in stuff for the kids to eat that day because every it was happened to be my day to do it, and so I did. And anyway, did you coordinate that? Did you know, you, it, you it just yeah, paper, it all just worked. Accident? The paper turned. Well, you know, a, a week <laughs> later, he a week later, the professor stands mm -hmm. up there and he says, you know, the papers were all good, but I, the one particularly caught my eye. I want to read it, and he reads my paper, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, maybe it was a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I doubt if my paper was better. I certainly wasn't the best student in the class. But you had good cookies, too, that yeah, day. Yeah, good cookies. <laughs> well, this is exciting because it's so simple, it's so logical, and it's so powerful. And that anybody listening, yeah. uh, this is a, a wonderful tool, uh, just a, as a concept. It's great. Well, I got to tell you that I get embarrassed at times because the stuff I teach is so easy and so obvious that you mm -hmm. think, why doesn't everybody do it? But mm -hmm. they don't. They simply don't. And the nice part about it is being e easy is mm -hmm. anybody listening to this today can do it today. Right. You, there's, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to learn anything. Just don't assume that one thing is going to get anybody's attention. Mm -hmm. when you find one central thing and build other things around it. It's the only way in your personal relationships. You know, on Valentine's Day, I do three things for my wife. Uh, you know, I mean, this, the, there is a real magic in threes. There's, the, you know, there, there's three strikes and you're out. There's three beats to a joke. There's, there's the Holy Trinity in the Bible. You know, the three wise men. Mm -hmm. uh, there is certain. There's a magic to threes. A real magic to it. Wow, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's talk about a couple other things in sure. your book. Um, you said uh, you have the concept of uh, backwards thinking, and you also focus on uh, what you call the gatekeepers. I think if you would mind speaking yeah, sure. about that for a minute. Well, backwards thinking is basically taking the, a goal, your end result, and working backwards to where you are now mm -hmm. through a seri the series of gatekeepers that will have to say yes to you to let you through. Along the way, if I want to get from where I am now to whatever objective I have, mm -hmm. let's say it's I want to get an acting job in a movie, okay. who, there's going to be a series of gatekeepers between me and that job. You know? People are gatekeepers. Yeah, and these people mm -hmm have to say yes to you. They have to open the gates to let you through. You have to find the key to get them to open the gates. Mm -hmm. So taking that example, for example, of the movie, if you start, I want a part in the next Spielberg movie, okay? Well, who makes that decision? Well, mm -hmm. Steven certainly does, but probably his producer is involved as well. If he's making a movie for a network or a studio, they may have a say certainly with the major parts. Mm -hmm. um, but before you ever get to Mr. Spielberg, you've got to get a casting director to send you in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the casting director, so not only is Spielberg or, and the producer now gatekeepers, but the casting director who's one step back from there. Mm -hmm. So you, you write down 
you take a piece of paper out, you write down who these gatekeepers are, and you work your way back to the next gate, which is the casting people. Who are they? You're working, Why, you're working your way backwards from, from, your uh, goal. from, Spiel, uh, the from Spielberg, Spielberg, from the part to Spielberg to the casting director. Mm -hmm. Well, you aren't going to get into the casting director without an agent, so now you're back to the next gatekeeper. And it probably wouldn't be much good to get on the phone and try to call Steven Spielberg directly. That would not no. be a logical progression of the way It just wouldn't it works. happen. I mean, if you uh -huh. could do it, sure. You know, if you run into him at a at a restaurant, you can, he's gonna, but he's going to tell you to contact the casting director. You're still going to have okay. to go through certain gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. and, and so you need an agent, let's say, to get to, get to the, the casting director. Mm -hmm. So the agent becomes a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. But in order to get an agent, you need certain experience. So perhaps you need to be lo working in local theater. Well, now a whole new series of gatekeepers in, ensues because you're now your, your short-range objective is to get a part in a local play mm -hmm. that where you can get an agent to come see you, where you can get the agent to send you to the casting director and the casting director to take you into Mr. Spielberg. Mm -hmm. it, it, now, what you do is you start at that end goal, you write it all down, and underneath the names of the, p the people who are the gatekeepers, you write the reasons they would say yes to you. What is it? What is it that they would say yes to? And you work your way back to where you are now. And to figure out why those people would say yes, you talk to other people, people who have gone through the same process. You read the trades, you talk to your acting coaches, you talk to uh, your fellow actors and such. And you, and you try to find out what is it they're looking for in this, in this, you talk to the agent who represents you now if you've gotten mm -hmm. an agent. What are they looking for in this role? What, what do they want? Do they need a name? Do I have enough name recognition? Or what type are they looking for? What qualities are they looking for? And you use this in any project, not just getting a job as an actor. You use it in, if you're interviewing with a company for a job as a computer expert mm -hmm. or something. I mean, constantly use this kind of idea of, of working backwards. When you've written it all down, you have a map to go forwards. Mm -hmm. You have now a, a road map to find your way forwards to that. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's some other aspects of this that we get into in the book and other things mm -hmm. about utilizing your assets and your liabilities and figuring out if you're going to influence these people, what assets do you have, where are you weak, what do you need to strengthen yourself, what liabilities do you have to eliminate. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, do you need more experience? Do you need uh, more contacts? Do you need more money? Whatever. What are your liabilities? What are the assets you can utilize as you go through these gates? I see. I kind of like what you said about the uh, writing down all the reasons underneath each one why they would say yes to you. Also, that's and good. don't assume those. Ask people. Oh, I see. If, you know, unless you've had the, a lot of experience doing this yourself mm -hmm. and going through it and really know and be very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, what is Steven Spielberg looking for in this role that you're going up for? Or are mm -hmm. there alternate roles that you could also be going up for? And what are they mm -hmm. looking for? What type? Mm -hmm. You know, what type of person? What experience perhaps are there? What, what's going to make them say yes? Mm -hmm. What are you going to have to go into that final session and do? Not just read the script. You're going to have to make an impression that you're the best person for that role. Yeah, because they have a need. You have to be able to know what it is. And so fulfill it. Try to be able to fill yeah. it. Yeah. What's the, the um, this maybe ties into this because people may be hearing this will go, damn, you know, I just want to call, I want to be discovered. Or, yeah. Do you think the problem is that uh, people don't do the backwards thinking and maybe they start at the wrong spot, maybe too high up and get disappointed and... They don't something? do their homework. People don't, in general, do their homework. If you want to leg up on the next guy mm -hmm. or lady, you really need to do your homework. Homework. You, yeah, you really do. You really have to approach something as, mm -hmm. I can get that, mm -hmm. I can influence it, mm -hmm. but I've got to know everything possible about it before I go in there. Just don't blindly go. Mm -hmm. Just don't blindly go in. I don't care who you are, if you've got experience or whatever. You want to know what people are looking for mm -hmm. in a job that you're interviewing for, in a school, in a, in a part, in a, in a show. As a musician, if you're you know if you're playing to an audience, what's what are audience? Why are audiences going to come to you? Mm -hmm. You know, in effect, a person who buys a ticket to come to your show is a gatekeeper of sorts. They've got to say yes to you, go out and purchase a ticket, and come to your show. What are they going to want? What How can you want? give them more than they expect? How can you send them away excited? These are great questions. You know, yeah, very good. I love that. I didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, that's all right. Go those ahead. Those are great questions. Um, your, uh, your life is not your career, however. <laughs> my favorite subject, uh -huh. my favorite subject. Uh, this, this is maybe the most important thing we'll say today, hmm. okay? Okay, good. Your life is simply not your career. Your career is a tool for your life, you know? Your career is one of the tools 
for a better life. So first and foremost, figure out what do you want to do with your life? You know, what do you want to do with it? And then be sure that that career service is your life. Now, I give people a really simple way to do this. Okay. Really simple, and it, it, I think it's, it, it'll lead into some other questions of yours. Mm -hmm. Basically, I want you to sit down with a piece of paper again. I always have you write everything down, or do it on the computer. You can do it on a computer if you're, if you're very fast with a computer. Simply make out a list, uh, uh, what I call a personal balance sheet, mm -hmm. a list of your likes and your dislikes and your assets and your liabilities. Now, on the like side, I want you to put everything you enjoy and I want you to prioritize it, which is why a computer will work well, but or you can recopy the list once you make. First, mm -hmm. write down everything you like to do, everything. I mean, from sex to basketball to, which, to uh, you know, being with your family to uh, being outdoors to working with computers and so on. Everything on the like side. Everything. Make a nice long list. How do, what are the things you like? Then go back to that list and prioritize it. What's the number one thing you enjoy the most in your life? Number mm -hmm. two, number three. There may be a tie. It may be hard to decide between two, but just prioritize them. Do the same thing on the other side. Make a list of your dislikes. Mm -hmm. What do you least like to do? Are you Get, talking about activities now, or it could be you say it could I hate be boredom or something like whatever. that? Whatever it can be, it can anything? be anything. Acti it, it, what are the things that give you the most pleasure, the most fulfillment, the most enjoyment in your life? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you write down, I don't like to get up early in the morning. You're not probably, and that's your number one dislike. You're probably not going to be an early morning disc jockey or a stockbroker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might be, you might have those jobs, but if getting up early in the morning is something that you just hate, mm -hmm. then those jobs better give you a lot of the things on your like list mm -hmm. in order for you to put up with. Mm -hmm. the certain things on your dislike list. Mm -hmm. the, the objective once you finish this list and you prioritize them both, your objective mm -hmm. is then to look for a career that maximizes the like side and minimizes the dislikes. Mm -hmm. And the reason you do this is if, if you end up with a career that services your life, that services and fulfills those things on the like side of your list mm -hmm. and has very few of the dislike side, you will then be very good at that career. Mm -hmm. you'll end up being very successful at it mm -hmm. because you will want to get up every morning and go to work or you know you won't think of it as work you'll you know you can't but, wait to get it no it's that whole old philosophy i mean mm -hmm. people say it other ways you know if you can make your hobby your career mm -hmm. you're going to have a great life mm -hmm. well in a sense that's what i'm telling people to do i'm just giving them a very organized way to do it uh -huh. that's great yeah you always emphasize writing things down too yeah you, you need can't to write just sit down. around and talk about it or if you no. just sit around and think about it, it's the not The insights come from writing it down. I see, yeah. You know, thinking about it's great. Mm -hmm. By the way, when you get down to assets and liabilities, your strengths and your weaknesses, which is another part of the balance right. sheet, I think it's very important to ask other people. A lot of times oh. we tend to underestimate our assets or our mm -hmm. strengths and, we, and maybe overestimate our liabilities. People, people have a tendency. So talk to a number of people. Don't take any one opinion. Don't just ask your parents or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever. Mm -hmm. Ask several people. If certain things come up as characteristics that they see in you uh, or, or abilities or lack of abilities that they see in you and they're consistent and several people say it, then I think it's time to be sure you put those down properly. That's and otherwise, right. just be honest. I go back to honesty, which is a major tenet. You know, be honest uh -huh. with yourself about what things are. Yeah, and I see. Um, one of the incredible things that you've done was the um, "We Are the World" and "Hands Across America." Yeah. Those are incredible events. <coughs> and I was just wondering, are two things because we're, believe it or not, it almost out of time. <laughs> it goes fast. When it you're does, yeah. But uh, two things I want to ask you about that. Um, by putting on those events, uh, maybe three things. What makes an excellent event that possibly an, an up-and-coming artist can put together? Mm -hmm. What are the uh, things that make an excellent event? What uh, th strategies did you use to put those events together? And also, how can an up-and-coming artist maybe learn from that experience? And then also, what is your most, uh, what is your, your favorite uh, accomplishment in your life so far of all the things you've done? Well, quickly, I will tell you that uh, every great thing balances on the razor edge of disaster. It's a quote from Thornton Wilder, and I have found it absolutely true. Hmm. 
And uh, We Are the World, Hands Across America, almost didn't happen. I mean, the, the rock artists walked out the night before only because Springsteen didn't go with them. Uh, they, they come back, they decided they didn't like the song, they didn't want to stand next to the non They didn't like the artist. song? Yeah, they didn't think, the, they thought the song was too pop, they, they thought the, uh, mm. they didn't want to stand next to the non-rockers on the stage. They didn't, you know, Lionel Richie has a great line, you are who you hug, and they didn't want to hug, they didn't want to be next to those people mm. and somehow have their lack of hipness rub off on, the, on them, you know. Mm. So uh, it, that balanced on the Razor Edge Attention. Hands Across America, uh, didn't have insurance until the last minute and almost didn't happen. So I've always found that the greatest things, the best things I've done are always fraught with danger and, you, and, and they're always on the edge of not happening. And one of the biggest things about putting on events, one of the biggest lessons to learn mm -hmm. is that if you truly believe in something, there are going to be moments that you're going to have to be willing not to throw the towel in, mm -hmm. not to say stop and gut it through. Uh, you know, great things happen when you take risks. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and seemingly you need to, need to, if you believe strongly enough in something, you need to see it through. And if you fail, at least you failed knowing you did everything possible to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there were great lessons from these things. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned is, is the difficult balance between creating certain expectations, which happened to us with Hands Across America, and then having to live up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. People expected us to raise over $100 million, and we only raised from Hands Across America about $34 million. Mm -hmm. The two events together raised $106 million, but Hands Across America raised $34 million. And the media tended to say we weren't successful because we only raised 34 million because they had anticipated so much more. The expectation was so high. The uh -huh. reality was that seven million people held hands across the country. Uh -huh. The reality was it was the largest public event in the history of our country. So it was. And it almost even didn't even happen. And and also you have expectations. And you can almost feel like you had a failure when you had a tremendous tremendous event. success. You know, Ken. Our time is oh, up. I wish bad. I could sit here for another hour and talk to you. Was that your greatest accomplishment? No, my greatest accomplishment is the seven-year-old daughter I have, oh. undoubtedly. Fantastic. I love okay, it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank I'm honored you. and privileged to yeah, have you. Great. My good, pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank you.